morning this is also like on an average very younger and more tech savvy audience for this presentation generally i've given it to audience which is more policy makers and i can get away by saying anything in tech but i don't think that'll be possible now um so yeah pmgsy3 was a scheme which was launched in 2018 and the larger objective was that we have even though 80000 crores is a lot of money it would only be able to upgrade about 1 lakh 25000 kilometers of rural roads but the total pool of rural roads is 45 lakh kilometers so it's a hard selection problem and how do you decide which road should be built the broader objective in the policy is that we have to help educational agriculture and health outcomes but it qualitatively says that and if if all of us are aware that roads play a very socio it's a very sensitive political issue right be it elections or otherwise and so there are a lot of competing demands on which road should be built what i may think should be a good answer for a road might not be true for someone else someone might want the road to go to their farmhouse or to an illegal mine so there's a lot of tension in which road needs to be built and these are large contracts so there's a lot of uh, special interest also playing around so now how do we decide which road should be built under this program to get a quick sense of how the planning generally happens there was a scheme which was launched before this which i am using as the baseline but very briefly what happens is that if the planning operates at a block level and so a block is an area which would have say about 100 villages and there be a block engineer who would be in charge of that particular area so first you list down all the roads you list down all the habitations you list down where all the facilities are that's like the inventory phase and then the block engineer selects some routes out of that so if there are 100 roads you can make as many routes as you want right because uh, someone who's driving on the road does not know when administratively a road starts or ends so you're looking for routes and so the block engineer then sits down and thinks of three four routes which he or she thinks are good for the scheme and so they select three four roads and then there's a formula in the policy in the existing uh, the pre-existing policy which rudimentarily decides that this road has x number of habitations on it so many facilities this is the length so this is a score given to the road and the road which gets the highest score is what is picked so that's very briefly the policy which was happening now a very clear problem there are many problems but like the main problem with this uh, which i'll focus on now is that the selection Uh, basically decides what will win right so if the block engineer knows that he or she wants this particular road to come up in the priority in the scoring and the scoring is known to them how the scoring happens so they decide the road say it's a road which goes to their house and they find three other roads which are worse off than that right and then you make that the competition you put it in the pool and then yeah it'll go in the system and it'll appear that the road they selected is the uh, most optimum one and that will get built so the competition in itself is not fair now there are unlimited combinations of roads and routes which can be made so we cannot even brute force our way into it and put in all the possible combinations and so the larger problem which we wanted to solve was how do we make with the second part of it the one in the dotted line how do we make the competition more fair if by any chance we knew certain roads which could win uh, in the competition and we would put them in the race as well and let the process continue as possible so as i said the larger is how do i make the competition more fair um and also like a simpler example of why it's not fair if it wasn't obvious before is imagine if i am at a school and i want to run a uh, i have to select 10 people who are going to run the race if i am in charge of deciding who 10 are going to run the race i can pretty much decide who's going to come first second and third right it's not a fair competition so how do we make the competition fair if we could like at the central government at the planning level could we add our own horses into the race like yeah, let the race happen let the uh, block engineers decide what they want to because obviously they'll also know much more than us because they're on the ground but how do we add some of our own horses to the race to make sure that the competition is fair and so it boils down to this question how do we know which roads are being used for schools hospitals and market so it's a 45 lakh kilometer road network you don't have proxy data such as google maps or like other mobility data sets and you can't run your own surveys it's uh, massive like at this scale it'll be super expensive to run it on all roads so is there a way to simulate this um the ones who are aware uh, of gis there's this network planning or network optimization which happens within gis 
But very briefly, what we want to do, we know the destinations, primary schools, high schools, veterinary hospitals, community health centers, we know their locations. We know the location of every habitation and we have the road network. So I could simulate the usage of the roads. I could iterate, I could go to each habitation. I could decide that this habitation will go to its nearest high school, will go to its nearest CHC, and I can draw the routes from every single habitation to their nearest facilities. And so the policy listed down 22 kinds of facilities for which we wanted to give them access. So you go to each village, you find out the nearest 22 kinds of important facilities which we think are important for the policy. You draw the route from every village to that nearest facility, and then you repeat it for one million habitations within the country. And so when you've done that, you've, you get around 22 million routes, you put them over each other, and you sort of get the sense of how each part of my road network, how many people are using it. And if such that this part of the road network deteriorates, X number of people will not be able to go to their schools, hospitals, and market. So that's in brief the uh, logic behind this. In civil engineering, they already do this. This is an origin destination survey. And we are trying to simulate that and do it quickly. And there are multiple assumptions which we are taking, right? That people prefer to go to their nearest schools, hospitals, and market, that these are the choices they are taking. And I'll cover those assumptions in the upcoming slides. So we decided we'll do this. Um, five years before all of this happens, the government had already decided to digitize. So we already had the roads, habitations. We did a fresh survey of the facilities. And we created a QGIS plugin, um, which did exactly what I'm saying. And now you can create the calculation, but the calculation in itself is not going to be useful unless you are able to present it in a user-friendly manner to the block engineer. Now this is a career bureaucrat on the ground, a civil engineer, not very savvy on an average 45, 50 years of age. So we created, we did the algorithmic work, but we converted that into a map uh, which looks like this. Uh, and we color coded it and we did multiple rounds of user studies with them to figure out what is it that gets most useful for them. So a map like this is generated, which is the trace map. And over multiple other iterations, we started adding other things which they said was useful for them. So we started putting forest cover on it. We started putting the water bodies. It helped them in the planning. But this became like then the central document for planning, right? So we would give it to the block engineers and we say, okay, these are the roads which we think important. So when we run the network planning at the block level, we rank every road, we give it a color, green, et cetera. And when we say, you select whichever road you want to select and put it in the competition. You get it from your MPs, your MLAs, whoever you want. But the top 15 which are recommended from the algorithm also have to be part of the competition. So you do whatever you want to do because you have to also realize you can't disturb this a lot. This is an existing process going on for years. So how do you tweak the mechanism a little bit so that you still get what you want without people realizing what's really happening? Right. So we said, okay, you use the same formula. You're free to suggest as many roads as you want, you make whatever combination, and the person would still be suggesting the road which goes to their house, but also have these 15 roads which have been recommended in the algorithm, part of one of the other candidates which you're putting in. So if you see that example now, earlier they only had those three roads and they, already, they only had R1, R3, R4, and R2, and in the competition, R2 was winning. But with the new process, the algorithm would suggest, say, R4 and R5 route is also important. And so you would have to compulsorily add it into the competition. And if it wins in the formula, it wins. So in this case, I'm showing that it wins. And that is how we did it. So the idea was also not to, even though I'm here acting that the block engineer is a bad actor, but that's not the case. The block engineer obviously knows much more about the area where they're living, and they can come up with better combinations of roads. So the map recommends which net which edges of the network are important, but we sort of, the way we train them, et cetera, is that this is a supportive tool, you figure out what you want to connect, et cetera. So the final candidate road pool is now the algorithm, the data-driven part, the local knowledge which the block engineer has, and also the MPMLA recommendations, because uh, obviously uh, they do have a right to, uh, they have a right to give a say in the process, right? And so that's the process, the pool is created, and then, yeah, the same, the same formula was used. So what we found out, so this was launched in 2018. By the end of, by the time I left that department three years later, 68% of the roads which were winning the final competition were also being recommended by the algorithm, which would mean, yes, two thirds of the roads were being pitched by the algorithm. It could also be that the, uh, the block engineer would have pitched the road anyway. 
but it also means that 22% of the roads which were getting uh, awarded or winning the competition were roads which the algorithm was not able to see. So while I was explaining the algorithm, there were many flaws within the algorithm itself, and there are uh, roads which people on the ground know uh, are much more useful than what the algorithm is saying, and it was also coming out in the formula. So about one third of the roads were unseen by the algorithm per se. And the larger idea was that, and this is something which within the machine learning communities um, is quite now known that you need to have human in the loop, you need to be supportive, you can't be overriding uh, human knowledge, et cetera. And so uh, that was the quick result of the whole thing. But coming to the audience which is here, the, the whole of it wouldn't have been possible without QGIS. But the way the policy was being decided, 2018, Around August, there was a cabinet approval that we have to go ahead with this. By the November of that year, we had to finalize the guidelines, how this will get selected and not selected, right? And here, I was pitching that, oh, maybe we should be using this algorithm, et cetera, and then uh, the policymakers were saying, no, but can you really prove it? Can it really happen? You're saying that you'll be able to make the software, but can you at least show us something? So like a lot of the work which happens within the government, you get very short windows to show it, right? The alternative which they were suggesting is fine, let the policy go as it is earlier, but you do this on the side and maybe it'll be useful, maybe it'll not be useful, right? But if you want it to be packed within the algorithm, uh, within the policy, you have to, you get very short windows. And we had to do a lot of, iterations with the design, even across the three years, just after the scheme was launched, we were still iterating over the design of the map, a little bit tweaks in the algorithm, etc. So a lot of short window stuff and multiple iterations, I think QGS was making it possible. The other alternative is to go to proprietary softwares, um, us tendering it out to like a big tech or whoever, and then you lose out on all the agility or, of doing the way we were doing, uh, working so quickly around it, right? The same, just tendering it out would have taken three, four months, right? And that's the time in which we had to come up with the POC and all of it. And also to run the algorithm, the algorithm had to be run at the state level. We would make the plugin, we would share it with the states. If we had not used QGIS and had we used ArcGIS, Arc then imagine every state needs to buy that license. And right? that's this corrosion and corrosion of just buying license for a 15 minute run of the algorithm. Uh, so coming on the yeah, proprietary, uh, this is something which I've seen throughout the time uh, within the government that they do have a strong uh, evangelism, right? Most departments I walk in, they're not using any GIS, but they would already have ArcGIS licenses, right? So QGIS, in my experience, we've not felt ever a need where we thought, okay, QGIS is not able to do what we want to do, but uh, it still somehow ha lacks the evangelism, right? People don't know about it. And once we've started talking about it in the departments which we work with, et cetera, people have started realizing, okay, this probably does what we want. But right, but it's re really hard to beat the uh, marketing and the sales of a proprietary vendor, right? And uh, crores are wasted on them, and oftentimes it's not used. Um, to solve that, we also created our own like GIS curriculum for the civil engineers, which was purely based on QGIS, et cetera. But the larger point being that evangelism of QGIS specifically, and which is also true for other FOSS projects, is very limited within the government, right? And so you automatically end up um, going for higher, like expensive stuff because they'll be in your office every day trying to sell you stuff. And sooner or later, some leadership is going to cave in and buy it because they want to do GIS, but eventually nothing gets used. So we need a lot of these internal ambassadors within the government. Um, coming to the iterations, this was the first, uh, actually this was the first POC which we had shown in QGIS. This was the rudimentary level. And this is the final draft of the same map. And all of that, that whole journey of iterating over the map, et cetera, happened within QGIS. Um, other examples of when we were really stuck and because it was open source, we ended up sailing through it. When we had created the map, uh, we, sorry, when did that start? It's 16. Okay. <laughs> so when we, um, had uh, created the PDF map and we had started, the states were creating it and sharing it with their districts and blocks. They would open it on their computer and they would, we, were, we told them you have to take the top 15 roads, but they were not able to find where the top 15 are. So they would try to control F on the map, but the text within the map wasn't vectorized. So they wouldn't be able to control F. For a legacy reason, we had created the plugin in QGIS 2 and I was not able to find how to make that in the Python code, right? But QGIS 3 had already solved for that. 
And so the way we eventually solved it was we went through the code base of QGIS 3, figured out what uh, internal bindings did they use, and we re recreated that in QGIS 2, right? And so I think that's something which clearly makes it uh, visible how the fact that all of it was open source, we were able to go into QGIS 3's code base, get those bindings, uh, re-implement ourselves in QGIS 2, et cetera. There are other tales. The plugin was a Python code which was open source, and we would share it with all the states, that you can use it. Um, I know certain states started modifying the code. Now, this could have been risky. They could have started modifying the algorithm, et cetera. But the instances in which we knew they were modifying, the algorithm only created a map and tabulated the top 15 roads on the right. Certain states thought that the top 15 is not important. They wanted to go top 20, top 30. So they modified the code themselves. Within the Python, there was this one variable which said how much to tabulate, and they were changing it themselves. Now, these were civil engineers who had never coded, etc. But they were opening my script and making those modifications to suit their own geography. Because, say, their block was large, or it was too dense, and the top 15 was not enough. They wanted top 30, etc. So this also started happening, which was... Um, Quite heartwarming, except for the risk that we thought, okay, maybe now they'll also change the algorithm, but their incentives weren't aligned to do that. There's a lot of nuance also to doing uh, service area analysis, which is very common to do in GIS, if uh, people here are from GIS. There are multiple assumptions, right? People don't always go to their nearest facilities, right? That's a large assumption we are making in the algorithm. We, th we thought that village level traffic to schools, hospitals, and markets is generally local, not like, say, in urban areas where you'd go to like a faraway school. So we took this assumption. Shortest paths are not always the preferred paths either. I might go to my nearest school, but I might not use the shortest path because maybe it's dangerous or I have to cross a highway or there's a forest area. So th this is another assumption which we were working with. Um, something which we quickly realized was the algorithm, the result of the algorithm depends on the quality of the data, right? The topology of the road network, how exhaustive is the facility network, et cetera. And that is linked to the capacity of the state. So certain states had really good data, which is linked to their capacity of understanding GIS, et cetera. And other states were, who would generally also be poorer off had bad capacity to create that data set, and hence the algorithm was giving bad results for that particular state. So it's like a double whammy for a state which is already left out. Because of bad data, the algorithm also gives them bad results. Um, the algorithm was running at the block level. That means it would do only local traffic within the block, and so you would miss out on the interblock roads. Like a road which is going from one block to another block, those roads end up not getting scored so nicely within the algorithm. And also simple things like you can't treat habitations as point. It's true for most plain areas, but when you start thinking about Assam, West Bengal, parts of Bihar, the habitations don't have like a clustered geography. They follow linear, et cetera. And so then deciding which point represents the habitation also decides where the road will go. And so these are assumptions we're working with, but also larger assumption is uh, counterproductive computing. To run the algorithm, collect all the data, took a lot of efforts, right? And when we're doing all of that, we are distracting ourselves from other things which we were supposed to do, like maintaining the existing IT systems, et cetera. So it's always like a cost-benefit analysis. The running the algorithm took a lot of effort, collecting data, teaching people how to use QGIS, and the same people were then not actively maintaining the roads, as an example, because they were just busy figuring out what this new QGIS thing is. So like introducing new tech also has all of these uh, bars. So that while I was writing the presentation, I thought the QGIS part was the only open source thing. But then I realized that we had also created a web tool called GeoSadak, which is like a web GIS where people can log in. And whatever they're doing in QGIS, people can now just log in into their browser and do it. Uh, and they can trace the road which they're proposing, et cetera. So this tool was built by CDAC, and it heavily used open layers, which is another open source library for GIS editing in the web. And given it was uh, you made using open layers, it was very customized for us. Like everything we would ask, OK, I want to know what are the habitations which are nearby, et cetera. Any feature we would ask, CDAC would make it, because it was not uh, like a commercial of the shelf solution. They would change it. And now, because it's open source, they've converted this into a product, and now they're selling it. CDAC is offering it to other ministries also, which I think is also only possible because they were using within uh, the tool a bunch of these open source libraries. So this is a quick demonstration of the tool. It's like a web tool, and you can see we are using OSM also behind. But any block which is proposing a road, they will use their mouse and they'll draw, because we quickly realized, OK, QGIS is probably not going to uh, get us through till the end. Like, the algorithm was fine. But like then other things like, OK, tell us which road you're making, they would then just point and drag and say and submit. And earlier, they, this would be through sharing KML files or just not sharing GIS data, just saying, 
from this village to this village. So we made it very easy, just draw it and send it to us. And all of this is open layers, which is again free and open source. And we would then at the central government level, look at the roads which are being proposed, see whether they're actually helping um, villages and habitations. There was a bunch of AI also used when the road pictures were, when a road is finally selected and proposed, they have to submit pictures of the road, right? And if the road is already in a good condition, we don't want to spend money on it. So they would generally give us pictures of the road and we would get say 500 or 600 roads at a time. So there'll be like 6,000 um, to 10,000 images. So we would randomly look at the team which looks at all of this would randomly look at some. So we created like a, a simple, uh, neural net which goes through all the images and finds out the roads which have majority of the images in a good condition. And then we would flag it out and share it with the technical team. Again, open source in the sense of it's PyTorch and also the network which we were training was pre-trained on ImageNet. So there's a lot of these open, it's not just open code, but open data, pre-trained networks, et cetera, which are helping the government move quickly, right? So all of this, again, in-house, no cost other than the salaries of the government staff. In the same line, while we were consuming a lot of uh, free and open source stuff, we decided that the data which we collected, which is about 2.5 million kilometers of rural roads, 8 lakh facilities, and about 10 lakh habitations on GIS, it's, it would be a waste that we would use it only once, right? That data could be used by a lot of people in the civil society, um, by academics, by students. So we decided to release the entire data set uh, in the public. Uh, under the government's open data license. So you anyone can use it for any purpose without asking a commercial purpose, non-commercial purpose, whatever it is. And so that data is now available for download for anyone since uh, February this year. And so it has all the habitation. So villages are six lakh, habitations are even smaller than uh, villages. So about 10 lakh habitation, lat long their population, 2.5 million kilometer rural roads, and about 800 lakh, um, Sorry, 800,000 facilities. So you can do a lot of things, right? If so, like a startup is planning where they want to do warehouses, et cetera, because the data includes all of that. Where are the coal storages? Where are the agriculture markets? And you can figure out which villages are far away from school, so you can decide to create a new school for the government. So the uses are uh, endless. We used it for a particular purpose, but it would have been waste to just keep it for us, given the time it took to create that data set. So it's now open. This is the link. Anyone can download whoever. A problem with release of this data, which is also applicable to the community, is how do we get feedback? When we release the data, a lot of people said, okay, but my village is not here, et cetera. But we don't have a mechanism to get that information back. So we've partnered, when we were releasing the data, we had partnered with DataMeet, which is a community, probably a bunch of you know. Uh, someone within the community came up with a tool, and this is, I think, the power of open source, right? We, were, we started talking later on, but the person came up with this tool themselves. They created a tool which shows all the OSM habitations, and it does a diff with all the PMGSY habitations, and you can find out which are the habitations which are not here or not there, and you can then click on them to either decide to send it to us, and we are creating an integration for them, or they, you can send it back to OSM. So now this is a tool which has come from the community. We didn't have to pitch for anything. And I think it also highlights the power of like releasing the data and creating partnerships with organizations where a bunch of uh, enthusiastic people are there. So this is Nikhil, uh, a shout out to him who made this and has put the uh, repository for this uh, on data meet also now. I think the GitHub link is an older link, but you can check it out, yeah. I, to the end of it, I think the, Future of FOSS in GovTech seems to only be positive as the government becomes more tech savvy with new generation officers and young people getting into the government. Uh, the government is now asking specifically for certain features. Otherwise, you, the government would generally take whatever is given, right? You would just verbally say, okay, mujhe aisa kuch and then the vendor would give something to you and if it's colorful and fancy, you'll take it. But now with like more product managers within the government and new gen officers, now we are more specific on what we want and what we don't want. And so that kind of customizability is only possible if like the vendor is also using open source, right? If they're also using commercial proprietary stuff, they wouldn't have the same flexibility. So as the government, as a consumer is maturing, I think automatically the software which is being developed for the government uh, by market forces will end up becoming a uh, force. But the problem is skill sets. Um, you, it requires additional skill sets to use FOSS. Um, you need to have that tinkering, like getting into the QGIS code base, et cetera. You need to sort of be a tinkerer. And if uh, generally that kind of a talent the government is not able to attract, you cannot 
compete with VC funded startup salaries, etc. Government tech has a branding problem. I'm sure a bunch of you don't ever think of working in the government on tech problems. Um, but yeah, this is the problem. If we are able to solve and get young people who within their colleges have, for example, used QGIS or Python and other open source libraries to do whatever they were doing, we create those ambassadors within the government who can then push for all of this, right? So it's QGIS or when, for example, my team, we use almost everything open source, right? But then I know other teams in the government, they use auto ML and like the vendor is able to sell them all of that. Similarly, I know one large government program is using Postgres uh, for its database, but now they've reached a limit. They do not have the expertise to optimize it, right? But like there's another program which use SQL Server, then Microsoft will be just there telling them how to optimize the database, etc. But for Postgres, they're not able to attract the talent and there's no Microsoft there to just give it to them. So I think the larger problem is that if the tech yeah, tech force within the government gets modernized, I think FOSS automatically also ends up getting those young ambassadors, which helps me segue into the fact that NHAI is hiring two data scientists and a product manager. I think two product managers, two data scientists. My team at the Ministry of Rural Development is also hiring data scientists and actually a product manager. We are a more mature team. We have a bunch of machine learning projects going on um, within the Ministry of Rural Development. So if anyone's interested or wants to talk about how it is to work within the government or wants to experiment with it, um, please feel to catch hold of me after the talk. Thanks. So, <laughs> questions? Okay, we can have questions, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you, sorry. So, uh, just out of curiosity, once the uh, road is finalized, uh, do we have an algorithm to decide the width as well? Uh, based this population? So, I think that's a good question. Generally, we are building rural roads, so they go for 3.5 um, width. But there are certain times, certain um, states, they propose 5.5. They say that we want to widen the roads. And uh, that's a small proportion. Say, like, 20% of the roads will come for widening, and they are more expensive, right? So, if a normal road would be 50 lakhs per kilometer, this would be a crore per kilometer. So we do check like this. If the they are asking for widening, we go back to a trace map rank, saying you're trying to widen it, but the trace map rank is 100. So are you sure it has the traffic, et cetera, right? But also a lot of time, the widening decisions are based on future traffic. Uh, and so they would be like, okay, but an SEZ is happening here or a new highway is getting built. But it, at least we have a way to start that conversation. Whenever they pitch for widening, we go back to the trace map rank. And because it's a smaller number, it's easier to do more detailed scrutiny. Yeah, but that's a good question. Are there any other questions? Um, honestly, no. We had QGIS going. We did it <laughs> in the time period, but I'd be happy to explore it. We were planning to further make the algorithm better for other investment decisions. Uh, hi. So uh, I understand like QGIS or uh, GIS in general will help you understand the geography, geographical region and stuff, like where to build roads and all that. Uh, how do you optimize for this thing? Because this is essentially I can understand in uh, sort of like NP hard constraint problem. So how do you uh, optimize for which solution is the best or like this should be the most optimal solution? Did you use something like Opta Planner or? I think uh, like a non-technical answer first to it would be that I don't think uh, after doing all a lot of this scrutiny, et cetera, there exists like an answer to which road is the best road, right? Even if you're able to eliminate a lot of these roads which are not useful, once we have that pool of roads which go to hospitals, schools, and markets, all of these are qualitative calls, right? Is a hospital more important or is a school more important, et cetera? Um, but I don't think it's an NP hard problem. The first part of it, which is the traffic simulation part of it, I think that's a deterministic. It's solved. It doesn't take a lot of time when you do it within the block. But at the qualitative level, I do agree that there is no answer to it. But I don't think tech would be the solution to it either. Right. My question is like, how do you scale this uh, algorithm, right? Uh, the algorithm that you talked about, which recommends the road. Let's say the bo block size is very large and there are too many edges. Uh, how do you scale the computation part? So we had a easy way out of it, right? So our planning traditionally was happening at the block level. And so we could run the algorithm at the block level. At the block is 100 villages and say, 
200 roads or 250 roads for that the algorithm within QGIS without me doing any optimization on it would be finishing in 15 minutes and we decentralized it so we said we'll not run it we created the plugin and we gave it to the states and so we said that you run it on your own compute and so that helps in one way but this was a con right the the reason we were not able to rank the interblock roads is because of this hierarchical decision which we took if we had gone for the district level it would have been better yes sir. So but yeah but we de decentralized by people we said the states will run it we won't run it it means it is giving the local optimized yeah yeah road. within the block because the planning also happens within the block, within the uh, block. by the bureaucracy of it yeah, yeah. happy to take questions afterwards um, if any through the day thanks <laughs>